Thank you, thank you so much. So uh, I will give you the time to to talk a little, a little bit about your career and to start your presentation. Thank you so very much. It's an honor to be here. Um, I'm so supportive of uh, what you and the, uh, uh, you know, the team has been doing uh, for such an event. Uh, so I'm really humbled. I really am. So my name is Monique Morrow. And as it says here, I'm uh, a senior distinguished architect in emerging technologies at Cineverse. Uh, one of the areas uh, that I have been absolutely focused in has been in um, artificial intelligence or intelligence systems with ethics involved, uh, ethics and privacy. Um, I am also the co-chair of the uh, IEEE and ethics for extended reality, which is really what we're talking about here. And, uh, you know, we're looking at also this intersectionality with, with privacy. The, the idea, um, you know, there, there's gonna be three things that I think, I, people can only remember three. So there'll be three things that um, I think people should take away from this presentation or three top of issues. One is what is happening in the world around us that, cause, that should cause us to think a little bit. Uh, number two is, you know, where is, where does ethics, where can uh, ethics play? You know, this is the part where I'll also have an IEEE hat on because I am a, a senior member at IEEE and as I said before, a co-chair there on extended reality. And third, which is the point that I want us to also think about is what does it mean to create a fair data economy? Um, so, you know, the title of this uh, talk or discourse is around ethical reboot and extended reality towards creating a fair data economy. So let me set the world before I go to the presentation. Now that you remember three, kind of to count back to the three again, what is happening around us? For example, um, think about trends, especially, you know, the, the, there are wonderful things that uh, the, the technology is doing. We've heard about it yesterday in healthcare. We've, we're he hearing about it in education. Uh, uh, there's just astounding, uh, uh, magnific uh, magnificent, if you will, possibilities with the technology. However, there's other things that are occurring. For example, um, you know, the whole concept of um, what I'll call uh, intrusions into the brain. So the brain interface work uh, we have to think about. Uh, Elon Musk has talked, uh, has, uh, has his own company on Neuralink, which is really putting a, an implant into the brain um, so that you could, um, you know, boost your health uh, capabilities, uh, address your anxiety capabilities, uh, if you go to Neuralink, it's a, it's a company, you can see what's happening there. Number two is um, telepathy. Remember telepathy? I can read your thoughts, you can read my mind, uh, my thoughts, but actually there's quite a bit of work going on in telepathy. Uh, in fact, uh, the military is operating, you know, looking at creating a telepathic helmet to uh, use your mind and your brain to operate how drones could work. Uh, I will also say in 2015, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Facebook actually said, you know, um, it would be great to use our brains to communicate brain to brain uh, telepathically. I could upload a, an image to you directly uh, and so on. So, uh, or, but you have to think about that creates another dystopian view or concern, which is around um, what I would call hacking the brain. So it all fits kind of together. These are the kind of dynamics that I'm talking about. And if you've seen the movie, The Minority Report, I would argue that we are here already. Um, so welcome to, the, to our realities today. And here's the thing that we have to be cognizant of. We do not have any regulatory um, uh, rules, if you wanna call it, that protects citizens or protects uh, consumers of, of the implications here with regard to privacy, with regard, I can read your brain, uh, and maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, maybe the thing that's happening in the brain uh, is, is quite interesting because you, people are looking at enhancements of your capabilities. However, we are living in this world today, and so we have to think about the implications. If I frame the conversations further, what we have to look at is 
there's data. So whatever we're doing, especially in the extended reality world, um, we know data is, is happening to us. We see it all over. I mean, this is just a snapshot from Raconteur, but you can imagine if you look at the, uh, the, what's happening, how much data we're producing out there every single day. When you're looking at your phone, when you're, uh, when you're uh, doing anything that has uh, anything to do that involves the use of, of the internet itself. Right, so this exchange between you and I. So there's petabytes and petabytes and exabytes of data that is being produced. And another word, word, way of saying this, there's various permutations. Is data is produced constantly, and from this um, this visual from Domo, it says you know we can see it's never sleeping. So you can start now to paint the story of why we're now looking at not only the ethical reboot with regard to extended re reality, but also, and, and its implications to us as a so so society, but also the issues around how is all of this data being fairly treated? Are you as a consumer, or are you as a citizen in the middle of it? Or if you are, how are you controlling it? Or if the, even if that's possible? So whenever we're using any of these platforms, which we're using, we often do, think about that. And how is that being data being amassed and by which entities? Well, you can kind of derive it here. And so then you have to take a look at what about ethics? So in the world of extended reality, um, you know, we live in many, many overlays. Um, you know, we, we, you will see that uh, the extended reality, wherever you, especially for today, when we're talking about well-being, yeah, because of COVID, you, you live in a world, there's, there's treatment overlays, there's the gaming um, uh, capabilities of it, uh, of what we're dealing with. And, and of course, there's also other parts of what we uh, talk about that are related or into, uh, that have interactions, whether with robotics, systems, uh, things, and so on. So we're living in many overlays. And I, I see one of the very interesting overlays around you know, uh, gaming, esports. And I would argue that, I, I'm not sure if esports is part of, of one of the topics that you, you proposed, but I would argue that during, um, especially during this COVID uh, uh, situation, that esports probably started to boom even more because now you're you're just so involved in it because you you you're now immersed. Think about it. you're immersed in that world, and you're immersed in in a um, let's say in a, a particular competition. And the question is, can you do you get out of it? You know, some so some folks have talked about addiction areas here, especially when we're, we're looking at uh, these these overlays of overlays of overlays. And so we live in constant overlays. And sometimes, you know, again, this is a polarity between what is positive of these technologies and what where we have to ask our questions, where is harm or the potential for harm? Where can that be? And so we uh, we have to think about do we choose to get out of our world, that world? Because that world is so better for us, that's the overlay, versus the reality of today, right? And so the, these, are kind of, these are emotional, psychological types of, of questions to pose, but you have to think about, um, you know, what are the implications? Once again, what are the ethical questions, the questions that we have to be asking ourselves in the process? So, you know, I would argue, uh, and, I, and I think we can't talk about things in a, this topic in isolation because it crosses so many types of, uh, of, of themes that we can think about. Security and pri uh, privacy. And, and I believe this is like the, the, the track, right? Security and privacy. And we're gonna have a colleague later who's going to speak, be speaking on this very topic too. So security and privacy, they come together. Now, they're foundations for trust. Think about what I uh, said earlier. If we go down the path that your brain is now, we don't need any, any device. Well, we have a device that is sort of 
embedded, it's intrusively embedded. Think about what that means. I could hack your brain. Think about that. Think about that for one minute. So, and how do you say, sort of try to, how do you have, how do you try to protect yourself from a denial of surface attack? Even though, even though the, the implications, I mean, the, the, the first cre uh, services that are, are needed are very, very valid. You know, I want to turn off my anxiety. I want to be able to address it. And I want to be able to do that myself. So security and privacy come together. And then you have to think about what is the privacy button? You know, when you're thinking about something that's intrusive or could be intrusive. So we have intrusion, which is the brain component, but we also have this overlay, this extended reality that it overlays that we choose to live, live in. And it has everything to do with trust. Um, you know, I always uh, kind of uh, put it in other ways that um, how you uh, deal with trust security, how is, you know, how is your personal inter, uh, information or how is the personal you protected? That is a, a component or, or used. That's, a, that's one area of it uh, or one, let's say attribute. The other is around authorization and the several identities that we live in. We have different persona. You have a work persona, you have, you know, you have a, um, uh, you know, a persona at the home, you have a private persona, you have all kinds of personas. How do you protect your identities? And what happens if somebody steals it? You know, so, so this gets into another deeper, if we peel the, the sort of the layer here around ethical reboot and around extended reality, we have these other components or attributes that are very, very important, security and privacy. And privacy, the component also, which interlocks very closely together is, um, are you, do you control your information? You know, this is around data policy or data, and data, this goes back, goes to where we wanna go, uh, absolutely uh, frame up the conversation further, which is around how do we set ourselves to the fair use of data? How is it, da how is your data used? And do you control how that data is used, right? Is control a question? What does the governance model look like? Uh, you know, compliance, and this kind of plays to the business the people who, the organizations who are in the business of, let's say, an extended reality uh, creation, right? Whether it's in devices, whether it's along, a re, you know, uh, research or, or whatever. And I think that that's important to think about is security in the privacy, uh, you know, area. You know, it's all about trust. And this is, this is the old uh, you know, expression. It takes so many years to, to build, but it takes seconds to break and it's forever to repair. And that is so true. So when your data is leaked, um, when your data is abused, um, when, when, for example, think about maybe in an augmented reality or, or let's say an extended reality mode, I'm having, uh, I'm having, let's say, a discussion with my mental health practitioner. What happens in, in, during that process if my data is leaked, right? Um, what happens, uh, you know, it's, it's all of that. And it goes back to who, what, what entities are actually, uh, you know, looking at this data, how is this data used? And if you can imagine, trust can be broken so, so quickly. What I'm getting to is how, you know, it's, there's a centralization or it seems to be a component of a data centralization that um, it concerns many, you know, and an example of that's how, how often do you pick up the newspaper and you read about um, a, a hack or you read about so many uh, um, accounts being leaked or whatever, it's every single day. And let me just take a step back. I'm talking about extended reality and I talked and I, um, you know, and it's ethical reboot. I talked to also a little bit about the, what's happening with telepathy and, and, you know, we should be cognizant of it now. And also and, and intrusive, let's say like brain research. But the other component that we have to sort of um, also think about is, you know, this, this, this notion of uh, you, Kind of walking around a bit uh, and exuding so much data, right? And exuding it in a way that uh, 
that maybe you're not cognizant of. It's like this data exhaust that's happening. Uh, and, and, so, and, and so you have to think about what are the possibilities of, of misuse in, in this particular space. So it's, you know, the thing of it is, is we have to be able to look at what causes harm and what causes, what causes is a potential for causing harm. And my, my, my argument also is that the technology and the use cases are moving so fast that um, the regulators don't know what to do, right? And, and I think that's, that's important. Well, on one hand, you want to you know, allow for this innovation to occur, but on the other hand, you have to think about, um, you know, regulation is all about quote unquote protection and, and you have to take, this is sort of a multi-stakeholder component, you have to take regulators along a path because they may not know what it is they're regulating. So for example, if you think about, um, you know, in the United States, you had some of these companies, uh, Twitter and Facebook and Alphabet, uh, they were presenting in the in front of the U.S. I think it's the U.S. Senate or Congress, but U.S. Senate, and they were you know was looking at what how they're controlling bits of of content or how they look at content and determine whether or not it's safe or not or whether it's truth what is truth and what is whether or not is true. The thing of it is is that you see there is the implications of centralization of this control, right? The centralization by, 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 some of the, by, by some of these companies, which we know. And I think uh, here is why trust is so important. If your data is being misused and you're not aware of it, do you care? Or would you, I mean, if you're not aware of it, you don't know it until something happens to you. And that's the thing. So people talk about metadata or um, they look at, some folks will talk about anonymized, you know, anonymized of anonymized of anonymized data, such that it, there's no, there is no, um, per, there's no attribute to you, right? It does not go by, back to you as an individual, as a person. So this gets into privacy by design. However, something can be looking at, there's something implications of what metadata could be and there's a formulation that's happening out there. This is, this is a thesis or, you know, and we always say, well, what entities could be breaking that data down, down or metadata down, metadata down, metadata down to, to you, right? To looking at it's you. And so, um, and that's why we sort of look at this sort of Orwellian point of view. It, it is a dystopian story that I'm painting here because I want people to be cognizant of what, the potential for misuse is. Um, it so, so it turns out that uh, you have some governments now looking at wanting to capture, uh, you know, a bit of genomic data or biometric data. I mean, and genomic data may be well, well in place. However, if it's centralized, um, you know, it may be for a cure for uh, terrible, terrible diseases, but again, you know, you need lots and lots of data, but again, you know, even though we're talking about this sort of extended reality, I have to look at what's being painted behind, around us. And if it's centralized, if there's a, you know, if, if, if it's not anonymized, if it's not, uh, you know, what we, what we think about as, as being um, privatized, if you will, or, you know, for, for privacy purposes, it's, it can be daunting to think that your data could be leaked like that, especially if it's of your DNA. So the implications of metadata, even in the, extent, in the extended reality world is something is out there. You know, it's, it's the data is, this is the data exhaust. And so we cannot ignore it. We have to be more or less aware of it. As I said before, if there's one point that you have to take, if I say one point, be aware of it to, look at uh, what we could do to shape a fair data economy or a fair use of data. Now, in some of the next slides, I'm gonna be pivoting with um, uh, my IEEE hat on. So these are gonna be IEEE specific uh, with some observations, because I think it gets us to what we have been caring about as a community in IEEE in this group, uh, this wonderful group of, of great minds 
uh, with whom I've had the pleasure and honor to have worked with in terms of looking at some of the issues that we've come out with and some of the recommendations here. So one is around um, five areas that we can imagine like uh, social interactions, how you and I are, are, are socially interacting. Um, mental health, big topic now, big topic now. Uh, education and training um, also. The arts, think about it, how, how movies are now being made with, you know, they think about that, the arts. And one that I've been stressing over and over is privacy, access, and control. And I've had, uh, again, super people to, to have contributed to that, to all five areas. If we think about framing the discussion in terms of social interactions, as I said before, the worlds are blending, right? The worlds are absolutely blending. We have a physical identity and um, we have new areas that we have to think about uh, as ordinary citizens. I mean, um, my worlds are blending. And so uh, you have, again, this personalization, this real-time personalization of extended reality. Um, you have some issues that we, we have expressed concern about. And these issues around a, the, the notion of collection the no, uh, in terms of uh, how, how you are collected, how data is collected about you, for example, um, and control and, you know, what is the potential for harm here or potential for exploitation of that data uh, is very, very important. Because here, you know, as I said before, the, cap the capabilities that I've been talking about and we've been talking about as a committee has been moving from external the external headsets, you know, this big bulky stuff that we hear, to something more subtle, to something more integrated. And we talked about implanted devices. I led in with implanted devices. I led in with Neuralink, for example, as an exa uh, example, or other implanted devices that have been, the research has been occurring for many years. Now it's not, not new, this goes to brain to brain interfaces. And so, as I said before, the stakes can be very, very high. You know, the stakes can be very high. Some of the other areas that we have been thinking about in terms of uh, social interactions and its, uh, you know, let's implications to our society is: Do I choose to live in this world, that extended reality world, over my reality? Remember, we were talking about that earlier. So, do I choose to just say, I'm, I'm going to disengage? And that goes to the mental health component. I just want to totally disengage now. And so you have to think about, um, you know, these technologies as we stated, stated are not created in, in a vacuum. They are, they cannot be in an ethical vacuum. They have to be, you know, coalesced and put together. So we do have to involve, we do believe strongly that this is gonna be a multidisciplinary approach. And I think this is very, very key uh, to involve researchers because the research is ongoing. I would also say to take regulators along the line too, because the laws are changing. They have to be part of that conversation, even if we think about a tech, you know, regulatory sandbox for this area of um, extended reality and ethics, but it's certainly important to, to converse in it. And if you're thinking about content providers, you know, like the advertisers, uh, you have to look at how do you provide contextual uh, and mandatory disclosure? How am I, how is that content being advertised and used and monetized and by, by, by whom? Um, you know, especially if there's no, uh, you know, human counterpart that's engaged in this. So certainly these are the top of my nearest shoes that we have been looking at from a, a, a social interaction perspective, so. And the other thing is, what about spontaneity? Uh, sometimes we look at, um, we talked a lot in the beginning around serendipity. We talked a lot about this because, uh, and this one, um, I'm, I'm, I have, uh, we, this one, this particular one around randomness and serendipity is really important. We could risk in our, in the extended reality world to get so programmatic and that we lose randomness, that we lose 
you know, you miss the train, you're going to Geneva, you're going from Geneva to Zurich, you miss the train, and maybe you meet the love of your life as a process. But think about that. If, if in fact, that you didn't have that, that randomness in, in embedded in your, in your extended reality, how that would be. So, um, you know, we, we had created something uh, or thought about looking at something called a hot key or universal escape key and to, to sort of develop a tutorial there. So when you enter that virtual realm, you enter that, that extended that real realm, you need to think about how could you exit that virtual experience and, um, and look at the information about, you know, what's happening in the tracking of you, right? And, 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 media, and the mediation of you. I think the, the, that goes to that, that, that information that's being gathered. So you have to be able to say, I turn this off. I want to be able to exit. I want to know immediately what information was being you know, uh, captured during that experience and, um, you know, and be able to choose not to share it or be able to turn that off too, right? So I think that's very important for us to think about. Conceptually, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. But if we think about the extended brain, you know, these enhancers, then you have to be able to think about how do I, how do I turn that off? How do I turn my, uh, my I, I, I wanna be able to turn thing, you know, turn the, the ability about my brain being whenever I go out that you can't upload, or I don't wanna have you upload something to me, right? So, you know, or be able to turn any kind, to be able to have privacy as privacy, to be able to manage, to have that universal escape key that is truly universal in all of the experiences that you are, you have and notably the data that's being gathered during that experience. That's called transparency. And that is, the I think it's ba basically creating a trust layer in our extended reality world, if you think about that. And, and I think that's, a, that's really very, very important uh, for us. The mental health, I can't say enough because me on one hand, we see, the wonderful use of this technology, especially for people, you know, uh, have been traumatized. It's, it's so important, so so very important. So uh, there are there are very interesting experiences for therapeutic, uh, you know, uh, that are therapeutic. But we have to look at we have to understand um, what the short and long term effects of that is. Right for your from your therapeutic experience using these 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 you know using extended reality um, for what we call mental health assessments we have to be able to to uh, understand it we have to understand what the potential for harm is you know and so one of the recommendations that we came out as a committee is to think about um, you know creating best practices uh, for, um, for and, and training requirements for the clinical applications of uh, extended reality for persons that uh, have mental health conditions and for the general public as a whole, because it's incumbent upon us. Remember, this is what you're doing as part of the education of the public, the general public as a whole. I think this is really key. Um, this means that there's an intersectionality between uh, this technology, the use of technology, Technology and people who are um, who are qualified mental health practitioners, you know, to to understand, determine what the best uh, approach is to immersion, and um, what realities do you want to control or have that uni universal key, hot key component or mediate, uh, and what could possibly trigger other other um, uh, conditions. So, very important as a recommendation very key as something that we should be, we should be following. Education and, 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 and training. Um, I think that uh, especially this gets into the way we work or the future of work, for example, there's, um, you know, quite a bit of uh, use in terms of being able to potentially think about how a layout, remember we live in overlays of a particular system looks like whether you are repairing a, uh, uh, an electrical line or, or you're out on a, uh, a boat trying to repair something, I think, or that's an example of repair would be, but, but more or less, we have to look at what is the, um, 
what is the potential that could be adverse here uh, if we have an ongoing, it's ongoing extension of automation here in, in these immersive systems. Do you have something that protects the worker? Uh, it has been a discussion who has been using this, right? This technology, immersive technologies. Um, so it's how we design um, the, uh, the, the systems. Um, and it's also to assure that we don't have del deleterious um, you know, effects on the, on the body, uh, physical and psychological. So the thesis here is that when we live in these overlay worlds, we're going to have, again, we have to think about what it means to us physically as what it means to us uh, at a mental level. So again, governments uh, will have to look at what would be labor protection measures that we would have to take um, and, and to, ex to assure that we're not uh, exposing people or groups and organizations to, to particular sets of harm. I have a few more uh, issues to address and then we're almost uh, there to our, to our arriving conclusion. But the arts are very important here because now you have art forms, creative ideas that could be algorithmically suppressed. Uh, that's something that we have to be very cognizant about. Uh, we have to look at the, the regulation with regard to the industry in, t in terms of arts. Um, what are the biases that come up, right? Uh, for, uh, what does algorithmic transparency mean, especially when we are adopting machine learning um, to support these sets of technologies? And could we have to look at what is the research that needs to be done to avoid artistic suppression here? That's very, very, very key especially when you're writing a book, you, you're doing a film, you're doing a play. Um, I think that's uh, very, very important. Who is the creator? How would you protect your uh, copyright? Uh, copyright? Should that be embedded within the physical and virtual environments? You know, we set a scene together uh, and we're actually doing it through our virtual um, experiences. Who owns copyright, right? Which entities can we share it? if it's virtual, in addition to when it's physical. So this will, you know, how do you rem uh, award artists for their original work? Artists are very concerned about this area and they, they, they're very concerned. They know this is a very, very interesting area for artistic cre uh, creation insofar that number one, our uh, artists are not suppressed. There's not suppression um, because of these technologies. And number two is that they're protected from a copyright creation perspective. And by the way, if anything, anybody can be an artist here. This is important to know. You, know, you could be the artist too. This is not just because my, my profession is an artist, anybody could be an artist. But again, so that becomes very, 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 very interesting. And we can imagine a world of, wow, great inspiring creation coming out of this. But again, it's how you're rewarded. And, Privacy and control is probably is one that I, I will stress constantly. It, it goes back to that data gathering. It goes back to the ethical issues that we have to look at. What are private spaces? What are public spaces? Virtual, you know, these immersion spaces. How do we protect that them? How do we protect ourselves, the virtual selves versus the uh, physical selves? And we do um, absolutely state that more research is, is absolutely needed in the in these areas. And we have to think about informed consent, not pages and pages and pages and pages of do you agree? It has to be machine or um, you know, informed. You need to understand it. We have to understand the vulnerabilities here. Um, you know, it, it, one of the things that we, uh, we always say is like, just you say that a pack of cigarettes could cause cancer. You know, what is the potential for harm? We have to so state that. And of course, uh, look at, um, educate the public. More than anything, we have to educate the public on the benefits and the potentials of, for abuse. Very important uh, to note that. So rights of the individual are important when we're encoding these technologies. Rights um, to, to uh, control your agency, to control your identities, your virtual ident your, your various identities. And we have to now look at how we adopt methods to to enhance the access, but also make sure most importantly that we have a governance model in place that can be well enforced and to assure human well-being. This is all about the human 
being in the middle of this, that we're not for, for, um, forgetting our humanity in, in, in this um, discussion. I think that's very, very important to note. Um, so we can be pragmatic together and we can really work together to adopt a positive outcome insofar as that we're cognizant, if you will, of the potential here for harm. And, and that's the thing, it's a balancing act of what is positive and what could be the potential for harm, especially when we're de dealing with our immersive realities that we will be encountering now, that we encounter now, and certainly in the near future. So this is a reference that you can all go to, um, to actually read those recommendations in, in detail. Uh, and I think this is something that uh, we, we actually provide that. But I wanna end some, with something because the title of this has been around paving a path to fair data economy. And this is a call to action. You know, as I conclude, our extend, extended reality worlds are indeed blurring. We know that, uh, we, we've stated it. I made the, you know, we've discussed this. Um, we need to think about what a fair data governance um, framework could look like across this ecosystem. And this is gonna go beyond, you know, GDPR and privacy by design. We know that data is contextual. We know that. So it's not something that's static. We have to come together as an industry to understand what is the fair use of data. What does that mean? Especially in our extended reality world. It could be various, there are various permutations of what we see in the industry today. Uh, various groups talking about something called very similar to a digital Hippocratic oath, meaning let's digitally not, do no harm. And we have to sort of adhere to that. But again, it goes to how is that going to be um, not implemented, but you know, governed at the end of the day or enforced, if you want to call it that. And I really want to uh, inspire all of us to reboot together ethically and to create a fair data economy together. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. Thank you. It was really